21st Sunday after Trinity. We're thinking about our nation today. Grant, we pray, O oh merciful Lord, that your people throughout the nation who are your people, give them pardon and peace, cleanse them from your sins, give them quiet minds, but also vigorous witness to thy majesty, glory, and the fear of thy name through the might and merits of our Savior, Jesus. Well, wait, let me uh, switch the page here. Um, now we are on Ascension Day Hymn 221, verse 2. Ascending to the Father's throne, thou claims the kingdom as thine own. And angels wonder when they see how changed is his humanity. This is a medieval Latin, it changed our humanity. Well, that obtains to regeneration. Well, we turn our attention to something I've never read before, the sacred dissertations on the Apostles' Creed by Dr. Herman Bitsius was published in um, 1823, digitized by the New York Public, digitized by Google. Um, we'll start more on the contents. It's 579 pages. Translator's preface. We might want to skip that. It's a lot of long talking. Uh, Memoir of Vitsius, page 11, the author's dedication, the author's preface, 35, dissertations, one, on the authors and authority of the Apostles' Creed. The history of the Creed has been amply discussed by Usher, Voet, Vosimus, and Heidegger. It is maintained by the Church of Rome that the Apostles are the authors of the Creed, and even that each of them delivered his own article. Nay, they imagine that they, all, they know exactly what article was dictated by each of the apostles. This they attempt to prove from the title, from the term symbolum, from the fathers, and from reason. These arguments, however, are either uncertain or false. The title of the apostles' creed is not authentic, and were it such, it might refer not to the authors, but to the matter. The term symbolum does not signify a collection, and if it did, it might refer to the plurality of persons collecting. The argument taken from the fathers is very uncertain. The argument derived from reason rather injures than serves the cause. That the contrary opinion is far more probable is evinced by various arguments. That each of the apostles delivered his own sentence is almost ridiculous. In the original simplicity of the Christian religion, there was no creed except that of Christ, Matthew 28, 19. But in the course of time, heresies increasing, various articles were added. The authority of the apostles' creed is great, yet not supreme. The creed is not a form of prayer. Dissertation 2 on Fundamental Articles, pages 16 to 33, whether all necessary articles and those only are contained in the creed. An article may be said to be necessary to salvation, to religion, to the church. The knowledge of necessary articles is either more or less explicit. A greater measure of knowledge is required under the new than under the old dispensation. Nothing ought to be deemed a fundamental article which cannot be found in scripture and which is not clearly stated there. It only is held to be fundamental without which neither faith nor repentance can exist. That also is evidently a fundamental, fundamental article to the rejection of which God has annexed a threatening of destruction and enlarge it a little bit if I can. There we go. In fine, that which the nature of the thing shows to be less or even more necessary than that which is propounded as holy writ. 
a distinction between these marks of fundamental articles. An equally distinct knowledge of necessary articles is not indispensably requisite in all. To determine the number of fundamental, fundamental, fundamental articles is either impossible or extremely difficult. <clears throat> Nor is it necessary, either with respect to individuals or with respect to the whole church. All the necessary articles are not contained in the creed. In what sense some may have said that all necessary points are contained in the creed nor are all the articles included in it necessary. Yet such articles are not improperly inserted in creeds. Dissertation 3 on saving faith, the sum of what is to be said. Saving faith comprehends a great number of things, just as life, for it is the spring of spiritual life, nor should it be restricted to any one faculty of the soul any more than free will or original righteousness, which is the less wonderful because the faculties of the rational soul are not, in reality, distinct. Yet amongst the acts of faith, there is one that holds the principal place. In the exercise of faith, an equally distinct order is not observed with which we exhibit in theory. Knowledge belongs to faith, which, however, in many believers is exceedingly implicit. The sum of the truths which must be known. To knowledge, it is necessary to add assent. In faith, there is pleophoria, full of assurance, and hupostasis, substance, and elencas, evidence. Hence, it appears there can be no falsehood in divine faith. Believers sometimes stagger with respect to the most certain truths. Love follows assent. Hunger and thirst after Christ succeed. Hunger and thirst are followed by the reception of the Christ, which is often spoken of in the Holy Scriptures and is connected with dependence on Christ. Explanation of the Hebrew term ha amen The soul also by faith surrenders itself to Christ as its Lord. Hence arises the syllogism of faith, the conclusion of which is, Christ is mine, which produces a blessed tranquility of soul. A summary of what has been said. Of the above mentioned acts of faith, some belong to it antecedently, some formerly, and some consequently. What historical faith is, and whether it be rightly so termed. What is intended by temporary faith? It differs from saving faith, first, in its knowledge of the truth, secondly, in its application of the promises of the gospel, in its joy. Fourth, in its fruits, why we say individually, I believe, one may be conscious to himself of his own faith. How we may attain to the knowledge of our faith, whence the difficulty in knowing it, which is sometimes found. To possess the knowledge of our faith, although not absolutely necessary to salvation, is in many respects advantageous. All adults are bound to make a profession of faith, the mode of confession in the primitive church. Dissertation 4 on the faith of the existence of God, pages 69 to 98. God is the principal object of faith. Whether there be any difference in meaning between these expressions, credere deum, deo, et in deum, to believe God, to believe in God, what is meant by the word God. That there is a God is evident from the terms. In what sense the knowledge of the deity is natural to man. A beautiful quotation from Maximus Tyrius. The conscience of man in various ways evinces the existence of God. Conscience, on account of its office and operations, was called a god by the heathen. 
The mind itself cannot be ignorant that it was made by God or for, for God. The conclusion is deduced from the consideration of other creatures. The expressions of Job, chapter 12, verses 7, 8, and 9, and of David, Psalm 19, 2 through 5. So Sinus basely perverts the expressions of David. He discovers greater blindness on this subject than the heathens themselves. Illustration of Romans 120. The strange perversion of that passage by Socinus, which is refuted. Even heathens rose from the contemplation of the world to God. This truth might be confirmed by further arguments. On no pretext are we at liberty to doubt of this truth. Faith avails itself of nature as its groundwork. Faith produces attention, depends upon the testimony of God, and teaches not merely what God is, but also what he is. Dissertation 5 on Faith in God, pages 99 to 120. And this is 579 pages. To believe in God includes several things. Even nature in some degree teaches us that happiness consists in communion with God. But that knowledge was lost among the Gentiles. Faith teaches it far more distinctly and efficaciously. Illustration of Hebrews 11.6. That knowledge of God excites a vehement desire of communion with him. Faith embraces with alacrity that communion with God which is offered in it. Diligent self-investigation ensues. Marks by which one may know that God has become his own. The great joy of the soul, exulting in God as her own. That persuasion of the deity which is derived from nature is calculated to produce an attention to virtue, but it had, it had that effect upon few. Faith in God is the spring of genuine piety. The attainments mentioned above are not equally conspicuous in all believers. Uh, dissertation six, faith in a three, one God. That's an interesting way to put it. Pages 121 to 145, a division of the creed in what sense their own distinct actions are ascribed to each of the persons. A simple explication of the mystery of the sacred trinity. The doctrine of the trinity is a mystery of which nature does not inform us, but it is confirmed by many passages of both the Old and New Testament scriptures what it is to believe in a three-one God. <laughs> I've never heard it referred to that way. The knowledge of the Holy Trinity is necessary to salvation. When, where, where will you ever hear that? Pope Francis just declared, you know, he's the, the Muslims and Sodomites are all children of God. They're all children of God are all going to heaven. Arguments which prove this assertion. The mystery of the Trinity was not unknown to Adam in the state of innocence. The acknowledgement also of the Trinity is necessary to salvation. Those who deny it are not to be esteemed Christians and brethren. The pious dependence of the soul upon a three-one God is principally requisite. Improvement of this article. Dissertation 7 of faith in God the Father. The term Father is applied to God in more senses than one. It here denotes the first person, who is called the first, not with regard to age, nor with regard to nature or causality, nor dignity, but with respect to the order of subsistence and of operation. The Father is of himself, not only as to essence, but also to the mode of having essence. He begat the Son from eternity by the communication of his essence. 
the sophisms of the Socinians detected. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and from the Son. The opinion of Episcopius respecting the subordination of the divine persons refuted. Faith considers the Father of Christ as also our Father. The condition of the sons of God is most excellent. The nature of the divine testament explained. The blessings of the testament. The stipulations of the testament. The distinguishing characters of the children of God. Dissertation 8 on the creation, pages 178 to 230. <clears throat> the Hebrew word bara does not necessarily significant, sig signify the production of something out of nothing, nor the Greek term ketizo, nor the Latin creo, creo. Theologians, however, generally use these words in a limited sense. Creation defined. Before the creation, there was nothing but God. Reason intimate, intimates and faith assures us that all things were made of nothing. Hebrews 11.3. This is impiously contested by the Socinians. The shapeless earth itself was created and was by no means pre-existent matter for creation. 2 Maccabees 7.28 explain, with which wisdom 11.18 is not inconsistent. The opinion of Philo, the opinion of the ancient Jew Hebrews, the dis distinction between immediate and immediate creation. The creation was affected by the mere will of God a bold tenet of the new philosophy. Creation is the work of God alone and incommunicable to any creature. The deity of the Son and the Spirit in union with the Father is justly inferred from the creation. The creation is not infinite. The world had a beginning. It could not have been created from eternity. The time of creation of the world is not certain, uh, not certainly known. Probably, however, its beginning should be referred to the autumnal equinox. The world was not formed in one moment, but in the space of six days. The question whether several works of each day were performed in a moment or in some space of time is not of great importance. The arguments seduced on the other side are not decisive. The question cannot be decided without certain distinctions. The world is one, yet nothing rendered it impossible for God to create more worlds. Those expose themselves to ridicule who hold it more probable that the moon is than it is not inhabited by men. The consummate wisdom of the order which God observed in creating the world. Improvement of this article. Dissertation 9 on the name of Jesus, page 231 to 254. So by the time we're done with this, it's halfway through the 579 pages. Four titles are attributed to the second person of the Trinity. Why the Son of God has a Hebrew first name and a Greek surname. The name Jesus is not of Greek origin. It is derived from the Hebrew Yeshua, Ha Yeshua. The observation of Rabbi, Rabbi Hakadis, Jesus denotes at least a savior. Inquiry whether it also includes the import of the name Jehovah. The name Jesus was given by God, the Father. It was solemnly announced at the circumcision of Christ. In its full import, it is peculiar to the Son of God. Yet it ought not to be superstitiously venerated. The whole meaning and energy of this name is in the Son of God, which neither the Socinians nor the Remonstrants remonstrance, nor the papists truly and fully explain. 
the full import of the name is that he is the sole author of a most complete salvation. There's Reformed theology right there. Sin is the sum of all misery. The taking away of sin is one part of happiness. The other part of happiness consists in the participation of the greatest blessings. Christ is the author of this salvation by sufficient impetration and by powerful application. Marks by which it may be known whether one truly believes that the Son of God is Jesus. Bernard's Pleasant Psalm. Dissertation 10 on the name of Christ. Pages 255 to 290. The second name of Savior is Christ, which several heathens, either from ignorance or from contempt, pronounced crest. Division of the points to be explained. The anointing of Christ denotes his designation to his mediatorial office and the conferring of the spirit. Several things are included in the designation. The conferring of the spirit has chiefly three degrees to which the threefold unction of David somewhat corresponds. Prophets, priests, and kings were of old consecrated by anointing, but not all of them nor on all occasions. In conformity to this threefold order of persons anointed, the work and office of Christ are threefold. Christ was a prophet. It belongs to the prophets to teach, to predict future events, and duly confirm what they assert. Christ discharges all these parts of a prophetical office. He so discharges them that the, his divine eminence shines forth in each. He exercised from the beginning, and he still exercises the prophetical office. <clears throat> the holiness, the miracles, and the death of Christ are to be referred also to his other offices. The priesthood of Christ is more excellent than that of Aaron. It belongs to a priest to offer sacrifices to intercede and to bless. Christ has performed, doth perform, and will perform each of these with exact fidelity. In the oblation, Christ is at once priest, the sacrifice, and the altar. There are three articles or steps in the oblation. Its effect is to put away sin. The intercession of Christ is full of authority. It corresponds in many respects with the prayers of the Jewish high priest. No man can bless another in the manner in which Christ blesseth as a priest. When, on what account, he that blesseth is greater than he that is blessed. Even under the Old Testament, Christ performed several sacerdotal acts. The kingdom of Christ is either divine or economical. The economical kingdom, too, is either the kingdom of universal power or that of grace or that of glory. It belongs to kings to make laws, to rule, to protect the people. None of these is neglected by Christ our King. In the administration of his kingdom, Christ makes use of his word and spirit in a way different from that which he employs them in the exercise of his prophetical office. Christ was king, even under the Old Testament. It needs to be said so often. This was never appreciated much in my Old Testament work in days gone by. I know Luther interpreted the Old Testament Christologically. Calvin had that sense. But my, remember, my professor, really sad. And I'm on the short end of the teaching at my old age, but it's there. I read the Psalms Christologically, and I'm looking at Moses that way, too. Where have I been? my age. Christ was king even under the Old Testament, co-creator. Genesis 1, with the Father and the Spirit. Now, I've been Trinitarian all my life, and Trinitarian prayer book man, so it all of it's there seminally and germinally. But chiefly after his ascension to heaven, the kingdom of Christ is eternal. 
Yet in a certain respect, it will have an end and be delivered to the Father. The consideration of the name Christ promotes to an inexpressible degree the consolation of all who receive him by faith in his true and entire character. Dissertation 11 on the name Christians, page 291 to 392. Those who were originally called disciples are, from Christ, denominated Christians. The name was not given to them until after their dedication of the first fruits of the Gentiles. It was first given them too at Antioch, a Gentile city, a city hostile to the ancient church. The church of Antioch improperly preferred itself to other churches on this account. Baronius perversely rests this circumstance to prove the preeminence of Peter as the founder and patriarch of the church of Antioch. The name Christian was no less despicable and odious to the heathen than glorious in the esteem of believers. The name comprehends whatever is most valuable, and first it includes almost every relation in which believers stand to Christ. Secondly, a participation in Christ's anointing. The anointing affords them the greatest privilege, the most lively joy. And here we'll have to bring it to a close. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the Apostles' Creed and for this servant, Dr. Witsius, and his labors in the Word of God. Though dead, he still speaks. We thank you for his, his witness to us in the 21st century. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Godspeed.